Hi folks, Mr. Ackerman here. Thanks for watching. Today's uh, video is actually a long one. I'm going to let you know up front. The reason is we're going to be talking about a topic that has uh, lots of different applications and therefore I want to show you a lot of examples of it. The topic is forces in uniform circular motion and uh, of course we're going to be talking about free body diagrams because we always draw those when we're analyzing a force problem and then I'm going to show you how this can be applied to circular motion problems, uniform circular motion problems that is. The four that I'm going to show you as you can see are the vertical circle with maximum and minimum tension. I'll explain that in a second. This is a classic circular motion problem. I'm going to show you a related example called pulling G's which if you're interested in fighter aircraft and stunt airplanes would be um, a topic of interest to you. I'm going to show you an example called the banked curve which uh, applies to car racing and also just to driving in general. It's a civil engineering problem so for those of you who are interested in engineering you'll want to pay attention here. And finally a merry-go-round style problem which uh, of course we've all been on a merry-go-round but it also has applications in other areas such as driving. So pause the video for a moment, have a look at where we are in the schedule, also this learning goals and success criteria. Just a heads up, this is part one of Uniform Circular Motion Forces video. The, uh, the second part is the one where we'll talk about, um, uh, sorry, we'll talk about frames of reference and the fact that a rotating frame of reference is an accelerated or non-inertial frame of reference. Those are these videos three and four down here. They're on YouTube. We'll be doing that in part two. So pause now, have a look, then come back and we'll get started. Okay, so you're back after pausing and we're going to jump right in here. In your course pack are some uh, pages that you can work on where you're given some scenarios and asked to draw the free body diagram. I've taken screenshots of the two pages that these are on and just put them onto a screen here. So the first one that we're going to look at, number 20 here, it says swinging on a rope at the lowest position, no friction. And they give you a picture, they show uh, the ceiling here, here's a rope coming down, there's some sort of mass, it's clearly swinging along this way. And now on here they want you to draw the free body diagram. So let's analyze the forces. What forces would be acting here? Well if you guessed that gravity will be working then of course you are correct. Gravity will act straight down in this case. Also we're tied to a string here so there's going to be a tension force pointing upward. Now at this time I'm just going to draw the forces with, uh, without regard to how long the vectors are although you might want to start thinking which of these vectors would be longer? Can you guess? I'll let you think about that for a moment. Pause the video, think about which should be longer and then turn the video back on. Okay, so you're back, you've had a chance to think of this. This is an object that's swinging in a vertical circle. Presumably it's going to continue on like this and go back up in a circle. After all, they did say it's at its lowest position. Well, if that's the case, then the center of the circle is right here. The actual circle doing something like this. Now, you know we're dealing with center-seeking acceleration and therefore center-seeking forces and therefore you should start thinking, well, what direction is the net force? Remember, F net is equal to MA, that's Newton's second law. And in a previous video, we learned that in circular motion, the acceleration vector is what we call a centripetal acceleration and its direction is in or inward toward the center of the circle. Now this formula from Newton tells us that you just multiply mass times that acceleration and you'll get force. The direction of both of these vectors is the same. The only difference is acceleration is multiplied by mass. So thinking logically here, if the acceleration vector points inward toward the center, then the net force vector points inward toward the center. And therefore my diagram here is not as accurate as it could be. The way I've drawn it here, the tension and the gravity look like they're about equal. You know, you might put like a tick mark there and a tick mark there like they do in math class to show that these lengths are the same. But that would be, that would not explain how we have a net force that points inward toward the center. So could you guess how I could modify this to make it more correct? If you guessed earlier on when you paused the video that the way to do this is to lengthen the tension vector then you're correct. Really what I should have done here is drawn this significantly longer as if to show that no, these are not the same, these two vectors here. 
In fact, the tension vector is greater. So I'm going to take out an eraser here and I'm going to get rid of that tick mark that I had made because I don't want anyone to get confused here. Doing a little erasing. There we go. And now things are a little more accurate, which is what we're trying to uh, strive for here. All right. Uh, I've highlighted this in blue because it kind of goes with number 25 over here, which is swinging on a rope at the top of the vertical circle. So now imagine that the mass has gone all the way around. It's now at the top. Now what would be the forces? Well, if you think about this, of course, once again, gravity is going to be acting. However, now the string is pointing down, and therefore any tension in the string will tend to pull the mass down as well. So I need yet another force on here, which I'll call FT as well. I've got two forces down, and therefore you have different free body diagrams at the top compared with the bottom. There's your vertical circles, top and bottom position. Let's take another look at one, this one, the merry-go-round question. This one's highlighted in magenta, as you can see. So imagine a disc that's spinning. This could be a merry-go-round, for example. It could be a CD that you've put into your computer and is spinning. It could be any sort of spinning platform. What are the forces that are acting on the rock to keep it going in this plane, this horizontal plane? Well, of course, gravity is going to act downward, as is often the case. And if you're sitting on a surface and you guessed that there's a normal force, then you're correct there as well. Uh, if you're standing on a merry-go-round and going in a horizontal circle, you're not, <clears throat> you're not accelerating up or down. So this time, it's safe to say that gravity and the normal are equal. Which leaves me with a question, knowing that this mass will go in a circle, just like someone on a merry-go-round, and knowing that F net equals ma, and that in circular motion, the acceleration points inward toward the center, Thinking all those things, what force is pointing toward the center? What could it be? So take a moment, pause the video and think, what force acts inward when you stand on a merry-go-round and go in a circle? <coughs> okay, you're back. And if you guessed that when you're on a merry-go-round, you kind of have a choice, don't you? You can either hang on to something, like if you're a kid, you hang on to the horse that you're sitting on. If you're a parent or an older brother or sister, you might stand beside the horse, but you still hang on to one of the poles. Or really, you don't need to hang on to anything. You could kind of brace yourself with, uh, with your legs. You could kind of dig your heels in, so to speak, and use the friction between the bottom of your shoes and the surface of the disc or the merry-go-round. And if you did that, that would be enough to keep you moving in a circle. So actually, assuming that you're not holding on to a pole and using the tension in your arm, we could say that a friction force acts inward toward the center of this circle. Of course, if you were able to prevent yourself from sliding around, which is often the case on a merry-go-round, we could call this static friction if you wanted to be very precise. Finally, we're going to look at something called a banked curve. This is a question that deals uh, with, uh, actually has applications with civil engineering. As you're going to see later in the video, I'm going to talk to you about a banked curve in a roadway. Uh, if you've ever been driving, especially on the on and off ramp of a highway, you'll notice if you look out in front of the car that the curve is actually sort of tilted on an angle, and we call this a banked curve. In this example here, they ask you to imagine a cone that's, uh, that's uh, hollow, and there's an object on the inside, and the object is sort of going around the cone like this. If you've ever been to um, one of the malls in your neighborhood, and you see sometimes in the middle of the mall they have this, this uh, it's like a cone, and you can put a, a quarter or a loony or something like that in, and it will, it will fall down a little pathway, and then it'll roll around before going down into a bin, and this is for charitable donations. If you've ever seen that, it's kind of like what we're talking about here. Those coins can go around and around an awful long time. They're kind of on a banked curve. What are the forces that are acting? Well, once again, Gravity is going to be acting, but pause the video now and see if you can pick up on the other forces that are acting. Okay, I'll assume that you've had a chance to do that in your back. Note that we're on a slanted surface here, so if I just draw this in like that, there's our surface, then realize being on a surface means there's going to be a normal force, and the normal force, of course, is perpendicular to the surface, so there is your Fn. 
Is this starting to look familiar? Are you starting to think of inclined planes? Because if you are, then you're thinking along the right lines. We're actually going to have to borrow some of our physics ideas from, from way back in uh, Unit 2, actually not so far back. And what we're going to borrow from there is the idea of inclined planes and two-dimensional forces. So keep that in the back of your mind when we get to this. Right now, I'm just going to mention one more thing about the forces in uniform circular motion, and then we're going to dive into the actual problems. So, as I mentioned up here, F net, of course, equal to ma. That's Newton's second law. And as we said, the acceleration is the centripetal acceleration that we looked at previously. What are the formulas for centripetal acceleration? Well, one of them is v squared over r. So if I replace a with v squared over r over here, I get one of the centripetal force, as it's called, formulas. Another thing I could do is say acceleration, if you recall, is also 4 pi squared r f squared, if I want to talk about frequency, and multiplying that by mass here, I could just multiply the m in there. Your, your textbook just rearranges it a little bit, and they call it 4 pi squared m r f squared. So there's yet another formula for the centripetal force, the force pointing inward toward the center that's causing the circular motion. And finally, I have a third option. I could multiply m times the other acceleration formula, 4 pi squared r over t squared, which what your textbook does, they move the m over, that's going to be 4 pi squared m r over t squared. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at three examples which coincidentally, or not coincidentally, I planned it that way, they coincide with what you see in blue here, the vertical circles, what you see in green here, the banked curve, and what you see in magenta here, the merry-go-round type question. I'm going to show you how to solve three classic problems using one or more of these formulas down here, just the old acceleration formula times m. Ready? Here we go. So the first one, which by the way is in your textbook, the textbook being Physics 12 by Nelson, so this is where I'm borrowing this from. This is sample problem 3, which is in your, uh, your book in section 3.2. And it says there's a steel ball that is swinging on the end of a rigid steel rod at a constant speed, so we know that we're talking about uniform circular motion because the speed is constant and also the radius is constant at 1.2 meters. They give you the frequency and they ask you to find the magnitude of the tension in the rod at the top and then at the bottom of the circle. Now your book goes through this so you can follow along in their solution, but I'm going to explain it to you as well. Here's our circle and we can imagine the mass is going around perhaps like this. And the question says, find the tension in the rod at the top and also at the bottom. So here we are at the top, and here we are at the bottom, going to imagine the mass in two positions. Now, let's uh, save some time by looking back and realizing it's these free body diagrams that we developed a little bit earlier that we're going to borrow. So go back here, and we can put down that at the top here you've got Fg and you've got F tension, the tension in the rod. And then at the bottom you have Fg which would be the same as up here. That would just be equal, of course, to the mass times 9.8. <clears throat> However, the tension, of course, this time is up. And it's got to be significantly more than gravity because if it weren't, there wouldn't be a net force upward. Well, we've got a name for this net force upward. It's called the centripetal force. We've got a name for the net force which you can see is pointing downward here. That's also called the centripetal force. And if we're dealing with uniform circular motion at a constant speed and a constant radius, then we have three formulas we can write for the centripetal acceleration, sorry, the centripetal force. They are these three down here. You want to pick one of these that suits the problem. Is it one with speed, one with frequency, or one with the rotational period? Well, let's take a look. 
Here they talk to us about frequency, so it makes sense we're going to use a formula that says f net equals 4 pi squared m r f squared. And now I think it's time we can even start calling this f centripetal. Means the same thing, has the same formula. Centripetal force is just a fancy word for net force when you're dealing with uniform circular motion. Now what do we do here? Let's start with the top. So I'll do this one in blue. At the top we have two forces going downward. I like to keep things positive, so I'm going to call the downward direction positive. I write Newton's second law, F net, which is positive Fg and positive Ft. I know that in uniform circular motion the net force is this. I know that Fg is equal to Mg, and I know that Ft, well that's actually my unknown. There is no uh, magical formula for tension. You're going to calculate it based on Newton's second law. When you rearrange here, you're going to get 4 pi squared mrf squared minus mg. I'm going to leave it to you to sub in the numbers and calculate the tension force magnitude in newtons. At the bottom, let's see what we're dealing with. I'll do this one in red. Now I've got a decision to make. I have forces going up and down. What direction do I want to be positive? Which do I want to be negative? Uh, well, since I have both directions, I'm going to keep down negative, up positive. See I have a different direction that's positive in both cases? That's fine. I'm really solving two separate problems here. They're not identical problems. Once again, I write F net equals, and what have I got? I've got positive Ft this time, but I've got negative Fg this time. It's pointing down. So writing 4 pi squared mrf squared equaling positive Ft but negative mg, look what I get when I isolate Ft. I get 4 pi squared mrf squared. Bring this across, I get plus mg. Once again, you can sub in the numbers and see what you get. But do you see right away something interesting happens, which if you think about this should make sense. At the top, I have some number here minus the gravity force. At the bottom, I have that same number plus the gravity force. So right away, you should see, even without subbing in numbers, there's going to be more tension at the bottom than there will be at the top. And does this make any sense? Well, what I want you to do right now is get something tied to the end of a string. It could even be your shoes uh, hanging by the shoelaces. And just spin it in a vertical circle and try to feel in the string or the shoelaces when is there more tension, at the top or the bottom? You'll see that actually at the bottom there is more tension because now the string has to pull the shoe back up and it's got to overcome gravity. So it's got to be more than at the top where gravity is actually assisting, if you will, the circle to progress. All right. So that's how you solve a vertical circle problem. And now I'd like to get into a neat application of this. And by the way, this is where the fact of the day where the fact of the video is going to be. So if you've been listening, you just found it. Uh, it's called pulling G's. And the first thing I want you to do is to imagine that you're lucky enough to be uh, allowed to go on a ride in one of these fighter aircraft, really agile, fast, maneuverable, powerful airplanes. And they're whizzing around and, you know, it's a two-seater aircraft, so a pilot's going to take you for a ride. You're just going to go in the back seat and, and enjoy, or at least try to enjoy. Now, how does it work to be in one of these things? Well, you could imagine yourself kind of like the mass on the end of a string in this question. So that's how these are related. But you won't be pulled by a string, of course. You are going to be sitting in a seat. So I'm going to try to draw a seat here of a fighter aircraft. There you go. And here you are. sitting there all happy. Or at least you will be until you find out what's about to happen to you. Uh, let's think about the forces that would be involved in getting you to go into a vertical circle like this. If you've ever seen 
a movie with airplanes. You know, they're always flying in circles trying to impress everyone and blow everyone up. Well, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to be part of this aircraft making that circle. What forces are acting on you? Pause the video for a moment and see if you can identify the forces acting when you are at the bottom of this loop. Go. Okay, you're back now. You've thought about the forces. Hopefully you've got gravity acting there. We are on Earth. Gravity is going to act. However, what other forces are acting on you? Well, you're sitting on a surface, so the normal force is acting on you in this case. And in fact, not only should you have drawn a normal force, but I hope you drew the normal force significantly larger than the gravity force to reflect the fact that if you are going in a circle and the circle's center is up here, when you're at the bottom, the net force must point upward. So what are we going to get here? We're going to have F net equals, I better designate a direction as positive, I'm going to call up positive, just like I did back here at the bottom, okay? So F net is, uh, is equal to positive Fn minus Fg. And if we rearrange this, something interesting happens. We get Fn equals uh, F net plus Fg. Now, remember, I always have a choice of which F net formula I want to use. Do I want to use mv squared over r, or 4 pi squared mrf squared, or this one over here? Depends on the problem, but quite often in Air, aircraft, uh, when we're talking about airplanes, we'll often talk about how fast the plane goes. So, I don't know, maybe this plane, if you know, these planes can travel faster than the speed of sound. They can actually go well in excess of a thousand kilometers an hour, but they don't always fly that fast. They might fly that fast when they're trying to get somewhere in a hurry, but when they're actually maneuvering around, the faster they go, it, the harder it is to maneuver. Just like it's harder for you to make a turn in a, in a, on a bicycle that's going very fast, than it is with them one is going very slowly. So what speeds should we consider? Certainly not the speed of sound. Let's just imagine for argument's sake that the plane is going 500 kilometers per hour uh, and of course you would have to convert that into meters per second and maybe we'll do that in a moment. Uh, so since we're talking about speed I'm going to use the mv squared over r version of the Fnet formula for circular motion. Of course, gravity is still mg. Now, what is this formula telling me? It's telling me something very interesting. It's telling me that if I go in a circle, and I'm at the bottom of that circle, the normal force acting on my body will be mg, which is what it usually is. Maybe we could call mg, let's call mg the, your usual Fn. This is what you usually feel when you're standing on the ground. Fg down, Fn up. Right? Kind of like a basic grade 11 normal force question. However, this is telling me that if I want to go in that circle, because I'm accelerating, I'm going to get something added to my normal force. And that, of course, is due to the acceleration. In other words, my normal force is going to increase. And if you think back to what we talked about when we began talking about normal force uh, in, in chapter two, remember normal force is what you feel on a daily basis. It's, it's what you feel if you stand on a scale. It's actually the feeling of weight. Do you remember that? It's not your actual weight, it's your feeling of weight. Remember, scales don't measure your weight, they measure your apparent weight. So I'm going to write that in there too. Now since these terms are added, it means that pilots, when they do these circles, feel heavier than normal. And in fact, if you do a calculation involving a typical speed for one of these planes, and maybe a radius that's typical, uh, what would be a typical radius? Uh, maybe it would be hundreds of meters. Maybe a, a larger circle would be 
thousands of meters, something like that. If you plug these in, you're going to get a large number in here compared to this, which means you're going to feel a lot heavier than you normally do. And this has some very interesting implications. For one thing, every part of your body will be hard to lift up. It will be very hard to lift your hands and your legs, and even your head could sag downward. Not only that, but the blood that your heart is pumping up toward your head will be heavier. And your heart, being only so strong, may not be able to pump enough blood into your head. You'll start to pass out due to lack of oxygen to your brain. Pilots call this blacking out. And I'd like you now to go, if you look in the uh, unit schedule here, it says pulling 7 Gs. Exactly what we're talking about is a video of a guy who came along for a ride in one of these airplanes. And let's just have a quick look at what's happening to him. So this one isn't exactly the video, it's this one down here. There we go. So I've, I'm going to mute the sound here. But this one, I want you to go watch it right now. Okay, so pause the video and check this one out. It's in YouTube. Once you've watched it, come back. Okay, so now you're back, you've had a chance to watch this, and you saw that the guy passed out a few times while he was involved in this, uh, in this ride that he thought was going to be fun. And you can see they're talking about how the blood gets pushed downward due to the apparent weight. Now, fighter pilots naturally have to be able to withstand these forces, and so they train, they're very, very fit, and they train with special techniques to find a way to keep the blood in their head. Otherwise, they can pass out when they're doing these maneuvers, like the guy is doing right now. Uh, passing out won't be a problem for this guy. Once the pilot starts flying level again, or, or eases out of the turn, the blood will return to the passenger's head. However, uh, this is a big problem if you're a fighter pilot and you let this happen. You're the pilot, and now your airplane could crash. So anyway, there's something very interesting, and the fact that I want you to be able to reproduce in class is the following. In class, I'm going to give you a mass for a person, and I'm going to give you the speed of the airplane and the radius of its path. And I'm going to ask you the following. The following question, which is, what is the pilot's apparent weight? And so you're going to calculate this Fn. And then I'm going to ask you this. How many times greater is this than his normal or his usual weight? And that's when you're going to calculate, you're going to think like a grade 11 student, you're just going to calculate Fn equals Fg equals Mg. And then I'm going to ask you, when you calculate this, how many times? So you're going to divide this number by that number. You'll get a number something like 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. These are typical numbers for fighter pilots. And that's what we call Gs. And that, of course, was the topic of this slide. They call it pulling Gs. If you make your normal force, your apparent weight, eight times your usual Fn, then we call it pulling eight Gs. So in class, you're going to have to calculate how many Gs when I give you a mass, a speed, and a radius. And by the way, if you do this calculation, hint, hint, you're going to see that the mass cancels out. It actually doesn't matter how heavy you are. The number of G's being pulled is the same. So give that a try, okay? That is your fact of the day, how to calculate this and what it means. Moving on, you're going to look at another example. This one for civil engineers, this is called a banked curve. And looking back at our free body diagrams here, it's the green one here that I want you to think about. So as we go in here, let's read the problem. A car 1,100 kilograms is traveling around a frictionless banked curve, radius 85 meters as shown. This picture, by the way, from Physics 12 by Nelson as well in Section 3.2. The banking angle is 19 degrees as shown. And they ask you a number of questions such as what force is applying the centripetal acceleration, 
uh, what speed is needed for the car to go safely around the corner, and how does the required speed for a more massive vehicle such as a truck compare with the speed of that, that is required for this car? Well, first, let's just recall that since we're on a banked curve and the roadway is kind of like this, it reminds us a lot of inclined planes. So I'm just going to draw one for now, and we're going to put theta in here. And if you think back to when we learned about inclined planes, what did you have? Well, we had gravity acting straight down, and we had the normal force perpendicular to the surface, of course. And if you recall, when we learned about this the first time, we did the following. We said, let our frame of reference be rotated around so that this is the x direction and this is the y direction. Do you remember that? This is like if you had a skier going down a hill. If a skier is going down a hill, the direction of motion is that way. The direction of the acceleration is also that way. However, to see what's happening on a banked curve, I want you to watch a video and then tell me whether you think this should be the direction of motion. So here's another video. This one is in your homework schedule as well. It's this one here, Harvick Wins 2010 Coke 0400. Go to that right now. I'm going to show it to you. Uh, I already have it downloaded onto my computer, but here we go. It's this one here. Watch these cars at a race. This is a NASCAR race, so stock car racing in the States. You can't quite see it yet, but in a moment you're going to see how they go around these curves. And you're going to see, it's going to be clear in a moment, there we go, the road is clearly on an angle. In fact, it's on quite an angle. That's no small angle. You wouldn't see that uh, <clears throat> anywhere in the city on a regular road, but you will see it on the turns in this kind of race. And so, one other thing I want you to notice, do the cars slide down... Well, actually, I guess I asked that at the wrong time. Yes, the cars slide down the, uh, the inclined plane if they hit each other or something goes wrong, but that's not what I... that was kind of funny coincidence. Here, you'll notice the cars don't slide down the ramp the way a skier would. They stay at the same level. And by the way, they're making a circle. The inside of the circle is somewhere over here. Therefore, the centripetal direction is to the right here. I want you to keep that in mind as we go back to a diagram here. My point from all this is that you do not want to do this because that is not the important direction in this question. The important direction is inward toward the center, going this way. That's the important direction. And therefore, what you want to do is maintain your customary positive y going up and, you know, x positive in the direction that we care about, which in this case is toward the center of the circle. See, the center of the circle is right here in the diagram. Now, if we do this, let's analyze what happens. And I'll just erase some of the clutter here. I don't want this. That's for skiing up and... well, not skiing up a hill, but skiing down a hill, or maybe moving something up a ramp, like, like when you're moving furniture. Okay? What we're interested in, of course, is this direction. This is the direction of the centripetal acceleration. So what do we get? Knowing that up is y, I'm just going to put that in here. Knowing that to the left is x, I'm going to put that in here. Now, recall, theta is here. I've got a parallel line here and with the x-axis, so that makes this also theta. And for that matter, here's 90 degrees, so in here I have 90 minus theta. And of course, these guys make a right angle, which makes this theta up here as well. So the angles that we want to highlight are a little bit different than the skier example as well. Here we have theta up top. Now, let's look at what's going on. <clears throat> F net is still equal to whatever forces are acting. We've got Fn and we have Fg. However, very important, this is in two dimensions. It is not one-dimensional, so you can't just add these. You cannot do what we did back here. This was a one-dimensional problem. 
all the forces were in a line. So it's easy just to add or subtract. You cannot do that in this question because it's a two-dimensional question. How do you deal with two-dimensional vectors? Do you remember? Of course you remember. You use components. Fn equals something comma something. Fg equals something comma something. And that's all equal to F net equaling something comma something. Now what are all the somethings? Well let's start with easy stuff. Fg, zero, and negative mg, right? Because remember, up and down is y this time, so there's no mg sine theta, mg cos theta. The normal force, however, is not exactly on the y or x axis. It's got both. It's a bit positive x, it's a bit positive y. Check it out yourself to make sure that you understand why. The x direction is fn sine theta, and the y component is fn cos theta. And so finally we get down to the net force. Remember, these cars going around a circle, they're not accelerating upward into the sky or downward down the ramp. They're only accelerating toward the center of the circle, which in this case is this way. Therefore, there is no y acceleration. There's only ma in the positive x direction. And in fact, we can write, we don't have to write a there. We can use v squared over r. That's centripetal acceleration. Or we can use one of the other formulas with frequency and period. But here, they're talking about speed. So I think I'm going to use the mv squared over r formula. Can you see how you would proceed from here? It's just like you did in the last unit. Here is your x equation. Here is your y equation. Try these two. See if you can get two equations and see if you can get a formula for the acceleration, or rather for the, the angle, theta. Once you do that, try to answer question C. Does the mass of the vehicle or the object appear in the formula? I'll give you a hint, it's going to drop out of the formula. There are masses on both sides, they're going to cancel. And so what you're going to find for C is it doesn't matter what the mass is, any vehicle going around this curve with this radius and this angle will have the same speed in order to make a safe turn when there's no friction, such as on an icy road, for example. That shouldn't surprise you. All of the vehicles on the road are subject to the same rules. We don't have certain speed limits for light cars and then certain speed limits for heavy trucks, do we? All right, I'll leave you with that. and going to move on to the very last one. This one, the classic merry-go-round question. So we're talking about this free body diagram here right now. So look back at how we got to that one. And finally, I took a picture here. I guess it's from freephoto.com. Credit to them. It was the only one I could find that had what I wanted, which was an aerial view of a merry-go-round. And there you see there are parents and young children on the merry-go-round. This, uh, this looks like a father maybe who's holding on to the, uh, the post there. Although remember, he doesn't have to hang on to the post. He could just say, hey, I'm going to stand there and there will be gravity acting on me, Fg. I'm on a surface, so there's Fn. I'm not accelerating upward or downward. These are equal. And he's going to have a force inward, which is going to be hard for me to draw here in two dimensions, but somewhere in here is the center. So he's going to have a force inward toward the center. Uh, this is Again, very hard. This is like a 3D drawing. I'm trying to turn it into a 2D drawing. So let's just realize that if I make this the center of the merry-go-round, then there is going to be a force inward, which if he's not holding on to anything and just using his shoes to prevent him from slipping, then that'll be the friction force, the static friction force to be exact. Now this question here, sample problem one in the same book as before, has a car going around, this time not a banked curve, but a level curve. And why have I put these two together? Is there some sort of connection? Well, the answer is yes. Here you have a rotating surface and someone using friction to complete the circle. Here, the road doesn't rotate. It's the car that does all the moving. What you do is you spin your tires, and your tires are made of rubber. And the rubber meets the road, so to speak, and there is a grip, which is a sort of static friction. So 
This free body diagram will look very much like this one. In fact, they're going to be exactly the same. And so this question gives you a certain mass for the car. They say the road is level and this is the speed that we're going to use to go around a curve of radius this much. And so they ask for a free body diagram. Well, we have that. They ask you for the magnitude of the force that must be exerted to keep the car from skidding. In other words, to keep the car moving in a circle. Well, this looks like a two-dimensional question. It's got x and it's got y. There's the x, there's the y. However, something nice happens on, an, on a flat road, which is that the normal force and the gravity force do cancel. So, in a way, you could think of this as a one-dimensional problem with just one lonely force doing all the work here, friction. F net equals FF. Either mv squared over r or 4 pi squared mrf squared or blah 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 with period is going to be used. They're talking about speed here, so I'm going to use mv squared over r. And they use friction. They actually start talking about the coefficient of friction. So do you remember for friction, that's mu fn. And of course, this is very much like a grade 11 problem where fn equals fg. So I can write mu mg. And once I get down to the bottom, as you can see, the m will cancel with the m. And we will have a formula for mu, the coefficient of friction needed to allow the car to go in this circle or to allow someone to stand on a merry-go-round. And once again, mass cancels. Does that surprise you? It shouldn't. As a civil engineer, you wouldn't be designing a road where there was a speed limit for light cars and then a different speed limit for heavier cars. Although, to be fair, that's a, that's a rough approximation. The truth is, heavier trucks may want to take turns at a slower pace than certain cars. Uh, and in fact, Sports cars might be able to take the curve faster than regular, um, you know, like a minivan or something, or a regular passenger car. And there are reasons for that that I'm not going to get into right now. Obviously, this is just basic physics that we're talking about, uh, and there is a lot more to it. And that's the kind of thing you'd study in university. But anyway, that's it for the video. As I mentioned to you, there were a lot of things covered, and that's why the video was so long, so I apologize for that, but you can watch these kinds of videos in parts if you wish. This is uh, the first video in the series. There will be a second one where we're going to talk about this, frames of reference. And just to give you a little hint on what that's about, if you think back to the, actually the fact of the day question, which was this with the fighter pilot, the fighter pilot was experiencing gravity and a normal force, and if you can imagine yourself going in a circle here, if you've ever been on a roller coaster, it's the, the feeling you get at the bottom of that, of a loop, for example, you feel yourself kind of crushed down into your seat. And of course, that's the force that's causing the blood to go down into the lower part of the body and therefore cause the pilot to black out. What is that force that gets so strong when you go into a circle? It's not gravity, because gravity is acting on you right now and you can well tolerate it. It's not the normal force, because the normal force is up. It's actually a force that only happens if you're accelerating in a circle, and we call it a fictitious force. I would only draw this force in the frame of reference of the plane, because that's a non-inertial frame of reference. The fictitious force, if you've ever heard of this before, it's called the centrifugal force, not the centripetal. I know when I mentioned the word centripetal, many of you thought I was just getting the word wrong and saying, uh, you meant, thinking that I meant centrifugal. It was actually centripetal that I meant. Centrifugal is coming up in the second installment of this video series where we will talk about fictitious forces. All right, folks, there goes the bell. I got to go. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in class.